Hey, I'm going to do a message today, and if you're in Clovis, wherever you're watching from, East, look, look we have Clovis, Portales, East Mountain, Edge, uh, East Campus, and, and we have a Rio Rancho Campus all watching live right now. And so we, uh, and, then, and then we have people from all over the, the country and the world watching as well, and it's just interesting to think that, that someone can tune in from Australia. And, uh, and, you know, where they're really being persecuted. And, and how about our Canadian friends? Man, thank God for a protest, right, to stand up and... But the title of this message is, Hey, hey Jude, A Demand for Action. And how many of y'all already think of the song? Hey, Jude. Yeah, I want you to have it in your mind. I want, you to, I want you to go home today and you're like sitting around going, why is this stinking song in my brain? And you'll say, it's that stinking preacher. He did it. And uh, anyway, but, but we're going to talk about, a little bit about the book of Jude. And, and we, we know that Jude was one of four brothers of Jesus referenced in Mark 6. We know that it, it's Jude in the Greek, but in the Hebrew, his name would be Judah or Judas. And um, we need to know this too, James was the brother of Jesus. And so Jude is also, in, and you, you need to realize they didn't believe in Jesus when he was walking the earth. They didn't come to believe in him till after the resurrection. And then they became one of his disciples. So Jude writes this book to the body of Christ and he says, and he's dealing with false teachers who are perverting the gospel. And, and folks, let me say this about false teachers. We always look from the outside. We get, we get Bill Gates as a population control freak, and he's part of this whole this movement, this, this, all this junk that's been going on. We know that his family supports Planned Parenthood in a huge way. At the tune, I think the last time I know they gave money was $378 million to kill babies. We know that. It's very easy. It's evident. You don't have to wonder. But what about the false teachers that rise up amongst us? And that's who Jude's dealing with. Jude chapter, th I mean not chapter, Jude three and four, there is just but one chapter. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, but now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy body. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So these weren't outsiders, these were insiders. They raised up, and then they began to deal with the grace of God, the very grace of God they began to deal with. And what bothered Jude was that this was not, again, attack from the outside, the church. They, these were not pagan people, because those are easy to discover. These were people of the faith, uh, supposedly of the faith. They were people who professed to be Christians. And Jude was, was a little upset, or he wouldn't have used the, way, the word or the term, they wormed their way in. So when I read the Bible, I always read it mellow, like everybody's just mellow and chilled. But really, when you read it the way it's supposed to be read, there was some irritation, there was some concern, there may have even been some anger. And so Jude saying, I want to write to you about this, but now i got to deal with this other thing. And so uh, he's basically saying something had to be done to these false teachers who were perverting the gospel. And this is why he is urging them to defend the faith. It's a call to action. To defend our faith, to defend, to contend for the faith is a call for action. It's contending for the faith, or contending for the faith is not complacency. It's to speak up and speak out. It is confronting this culture with the truth of the Word of God. Luke 19, 13 says, so he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minus, minus, or however you say it, and said to them, do business until I come. Some of you know it as occupy until he comes. Jesus, or the word of God, is telling us that as long as we're on the earth, we're to do the business that God has us to do. 
If we knew, and we will never know, that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, we're still called to do our business. We're still called to go to work. We're still called to teach the gospel. We're still called to spread the gospel. We're still called to tell people the truth. We're still called to occupy till he comes. And just for the record, folks, nobody knows when he's coming. So I guarantee in the next year or so, someone's going to come up and say, this is lined up, this is lined up, and he's going to come at this time. Don't believe anything. Listen, Jesus is not going to come back when you expect it. The Bible says they'll be eating and drinking and marrying. In other words, people will be partying, having a good time. And then the Son of God comes back. We think, well, he's going to come back through this pandemic. No, he's not. I knew he wasn't. Because we'd all be expecting it, like waiting on it. Please, please come back. And so don't get caught up with these false people who claim to know when If Jesus doesn't know when, how would they ever know when? And Jesus said, I don't even know. And so I don't know why I'm saying that other than just be careful because there's no 99 reasons why he's coming back tomorrow. But we are to do business. We are to continue to do what God wants us to do. And when he gave, delivered his servants that money, the 10 minus, minus, however you say it, It's about four months wages. It's about four months worth of wages to the people in that day. And Christ was saying we are to engage in business until he comes, which also means confronting our world with truths and the truth of the gospel. And when I say confront, I'm not talking about being mean-spirited. I'm not talking about getting in people's faces. I'm just talking about when when there's a discussion, we speak up. We say, man, you, you, you need to get born again. You need to get saved. Because those who aren't born again, aren't saved, aren't going to heaven. They have no hope for heaven. Our John R.W. Scott said, the church is under orders. Evangelistic inactivity is disobedience. To not contend for the faith, to not reach people or attempt to reach people with the gospel is disobedience. And we need to understand that these false teachers in this day were doing two things and it's similar to this today. Back in that day and today is very similar. So number one, the false teachers were doing two things. Number one, they were changing the grace of God into a license to live any life you want to. That it doesn't matter what you do with your body. It is no good anyhow. That's what they were teaching. Indulge in what you will. It was only the spirit that mattered. So what they were saying is when you get born again, it is the spirit of man, the heart of man, if you would, the soul of man that gets born again. The physical body never gets saved. It is unruly and left to itself. It will do all kinds of crazy stuff. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So they were saying because the body is no good anyway and it's the spirit that matters and that's already born again, then you can go do whatever you want. It's no different than a lot of people preaching today. You can go do what you want. The second thing they were teaching was that the grace of God is so broad that God will forgive, which he will forgive. But they were saying, the more you sin, the more grace you will receive, so go for it. There's no restraint. Now, these weren't people outside the church. These were people that you knew, that people knew, and they said, that's brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. And they began to rise up within the church and Jude is saying, hey, this, this is wrong. This is not right. I need to speak to this. You guys need to deal with this. And so people within the church are saying we have progressed beyond these old-fashioned biblical ideas that we now have a new morality and that love justifies everything. It was back then as it is today. People are using the same stuff to try to shame believers into doing things that the Bible doesn't teach. And we need to realize that how it was back then, people haven't changed. And so how it was back then is how it is today. This is very applicable for our life today. And just like then, false teachers have entered the arena today. And a lot of them are so-called popular preachers. You see it when the BLM movement is discussed in their messages. And when people say we should should buy into the Black Lives Matter movement, 
But if you've ever read their creed or constitution, you would be appalled at what they actually believe. It wasn't about black lives at all. And I've done teachings on this. And when some white guy gets up here and tells another white guy that you need to repent, you're evil, you're awful, I take exception to that. And how dare they say things like that? And besides that, folks, in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor Gentile. There's only saved and unsaved. And in the body of Christ, God created all of us. When we become born again, we should be one in Christ. And just because you have a different skin color doesn't make someone better or worse than someone else. That's the Bible. So all this fight we're having on racial issues out in the world will never be resolved because it cannot be, and neither do they want it resolved. Only the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, actually being the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, can help this whole thing called racism. Because look at around, this is what heaven's gonna look like. If you're a racist or you're prejudiced, you're gonna hate heaven, in fact, you may not get to go. Because there'll, no, there'll, no be, there'll, there'll not be any white heaven or black heaven or Hispanic heaven or Native American heaven, there's just one heaven. And we're one nation. We're supposed to be one nation under God. Not separated under God. And the world and its philosophy and Marxism are creating all these things. Are there catastrophes? Yeah. Are there atrocities? Yes. We're not saying that. What we're saying is if you're a Bible believer, color should not matter. In fact, most white people are trying to get more tan. I know I do. I like, I, man, I'm too white. And we all have something to bring to the table if we actually believe in God. And God doesn't separate us other than believer or non-believer, lost or saved. We have to choose, but these preachers, these, the guys that are raising up and really showed their true colors through this pandemic, they talk about it. They're, they're, they called, they're, they're, they're termed, they have a woke mentality they find their way into, it, it, this teaching finds its way into their sermons. You see it with the, with the denominations when they're succumbing to this pressure to, as they back off of major issues or altogether accept sins like homosexuality. It's called progressive Christianity, which let me help you, which is not Christianity at all. There's no such thing as a liberal Christian. Either you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. There's no, there's, no, there's no real thing as a conservative Christian. Either you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. And when people tell me, well, I'm a liberal Christian, here's what they're saying. I believe in abortion. I believe in the homosexual movement. I believe in all these things. There's no way you can be a believer and believe in those things. None. There's no way. You cannot. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to others. See, what happens is you want Jesus, you don't want to go to hell, but you don't want to change your thinking. And what did God say? When you get born again, you better change your thinking because you don't think like I think, and my thinking is much better than your thinking. So God begins to tell us. And so we, we have all this stuff. This movement is infiltrating and influencing the evangelical church, which we're a part of. And some of the most high-profile Christian leaders are so-called self-appointed leaders are a part of it. This movement seeks to reinterpret the Bible. It redefines core tenets of the faith. Woke, when you hear the term woke, this means that some have left the faith for things like BLM and critical race theory. And by the way, you should never let the public schools ever teach your children critical race theory. It is anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-America, and anti-our Constitution. And I've done whole teachings on it. So you can go back on YouTube or our app and look at it. There's whole teachings that I've gone through this in great detail. Well, Pastor, critical race theory is about social justice. Let me help somebody. Anytime you put a word before justice, it's no longer justice. The Bible says God is just. That means he gives you what you deserve, good or bad, 
Thank God we can repent so we don't actually get what we deserve bad sometimes. But God doesn't prefer one group over another. Critical race theory teaches you you prefer this group over this group. It's ungodly. It's anti-Bible. You can fight with me all you want because I won't fight with you over it. You can say, well, I disagree. Well, then you take it up with the scriptures. Because nowhere in the Bible does God teach this. Nowhere. Nowhere. And yet we buy into it. And if the church buys into it, then the world is lost forever. They believe that one group owes the other group, that we are evil. They seek to shame believers, these false teachers. They call white people inherently evil. They are, and, and even white people saying, we're all racist. We have to admit it before we can ever get better. And so that we all need to repent. And when you favor one group over another, it's no longer justice. And God doesn't prefer you over me or me over you. He doesn't prefer one color over another color. We're all God's people. Red, yellow, black, or white, we are all God's children, whatever it goes in his sight. I don't even know how it goes. Precious in his sight. Thank you for the help. This, this brother needs lots of help, so I get it. Thank you so much. I do. Progressive Christianity is characterized by a willingness to question tradition, acceptance of human diversity, a strong emphasis on social justice, environmental stewardship of the earth. Climate change is more important than anything. In other words, we serve the earth, so let me speak to a few of these things. Listen, human diversity is this, that people buy in that there's all these genders. Folks, if you believe the Bible, there is one, there's two genders, Male and female, that's it. There's no other gender. And if you believe and you're a proponent, I believe in climate change, we need to do, listen, you gotta understand the people who are fighting for climate change, that's their religion. That's their faith. And say, do you believe in it? No, I don't. You say, why? Because I believe in creationalism. That God created man, and from man he created woman, and he told them to be fruitful and multiply on the earth. He didn't put a number attached to it. He didn't say when you get to seven billion, you need to stop procreating. He never stopped. See, God's words are eternal. So when God speaks them, they're never ending. It'll never end. And so when he told us to be fruitful and multiply, he didn't create the earth too small for us to have 10 billion people on the earth. You say, oh, pastor, now you're scaring me. No, you're being scared because you listen to the wrong voice. My God didn't create the earth and say, oops, we made it too small. Oops, we made it with not enough resources. Oops, we can't do it. I don't know why I told the people to be fruitful and multiply. I mean, that's one message I've never had to teach. I've never had to get up in this pulpit and say, okay, guys, I'm going to deal with something today because we're not doing a good enough job at it. So today we're going to talk about being fruitful and multiply that you need to have more sex with your husband or your wife. You need, to, you need to get off birth control. You need to have more babies. I've never had to teach that. We seem to get that one done without any help at all. But God created man and woman and told them to procreate. That's what be fruitful and multiply is. And yet, if you believe climate change, then there's too many people on the earth, and our carbon footprint is destroying the earth and so what's happening is they're worshiping the creation out of Romans 1, 21, 22, whatever it is. He, they're worshiping the creation and not the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. God, God never intended us to worship the earth. The earth was made for us. I wasn't made for it. Now, should we destroy our streams and pollute our waters? No, none of that. None of that should happen. But to believe in someone else's false religion is not biblical. But you listen to some of these woke, progressive, so-called preachers talk, and that's a huge deal. And then you listen to them talk, and we got to be overly sensitive to the transgender and to all these other groups. Why? God made two genders, male and female. He made them. 
and he made them where they fit perfectly together. And the two can become one. And that's what God created. Everything else is man's creation of worshiping the creation, not the creator. That's why when, I mean, it used to think about when, when absolute truth is removed, absurdity reigns. And you think about it, you know, the big thing in the school was, you know, if Steve thought he was Stephanie today, he could go in the girl's bathroom. My thought was, walk into my granddaughter's bathroom as a dude. Walk in there, I'm gonna treat you like a dude. I'm gonna snatch you up and throw your butt out. I don't care what anybody says. You're not walking into my daughter's bathroom. You go call who you want, whiny, whiny baby, just go call. But see, we don't wanna hear this because we have family members. People get offended. They're like, that's so offensive. No, you're offended at the gospel. And if you're offended at the gospel, then you have no real belief in the gospel. Because the gospel should challenge us. It should, it should affect us. It should help us. It should, it should challenge the very core of our being at times. But we shouldn't get offended over it. Because truth is truth whether you believe it or not. And we need to stand and contend for the faith. I said 25 years ago, I, I said it over and over again, the most dangerous movement to America is the homosexual movement. And people mocked me, they laughed at me, they left the church and said, you're just being mean. Am I? It's the very thing that's destroying the very fabric of our society. You can't say anything without, you can't, you, you, you can lose your job if you disagree. It's destroyed the nuclear family as we know it. That's why crime is so high. That's why I was against this whole pandemic lockdown, because it destroyed more families than it ever helped. But that's what they believe. They also believe that, and they teach and they shame us, to love your neighbor the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the scripture they quote. It's the most quoted scripture in all of America today from the pulpits of these woke preachers. And they say things like love your neighbor as yourself. The problem with that is, is, that, is that they say that to love your neighbor as yourself means you take a shot, you wear the mask, you social distance, you close your church, and you listen to the governmental authorities. Because if you love your neighbor, that's what you do. And here's what I even heard a guy say the other day. Well, it, you know, the reason some people aren't coming to church is because we didn't love our neighbor through this. He said the churches had the audacity to actually continue to have church and, 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 and disregard all the things coming from the, you know, from the Biden administration or the Trump administration or the, you know, the Grisham regime. And, and, and they said, well, because you did that, you didn't love your neighbors yourself. That's why people aren't coming to church. No, that's not true. The reason people aren't coming to church is because the church is not any different than the world. We, we should have stood up and been the light to the world. And, and we did. Thank you. You did. This church did. This church stood up, and we were a light to this place. And, and, and they're, they're trying to shame us. Into, you know, even there was a big movement, with, and I could name them. Rick Warren was part of it, others that were working with the Biden administration to try to convince pastors to tell their congregants to get vaccinated. And I'm like, why would I do that? That's up to you what you do. And whatever you do, you should do in faith. I just don't think anybody should be forced to have to do it or lose their job because of it. I think, it's, I think that's demonic. And, and, and you know, our healthcare workers and the ones that are fighting this, you know, for a year and a half, they took care of all the COVID patients without any shots. And now somehow they can't take care of them unless they get a shot. And then there's no guarantee you get a shot that's gonna work. I know people that get COVID all the time that have the shot. Now, whether you get it or not is your call. I'm not saying yes or no. That is your, that's your business. And that's where it needs to stay. When the government gets involved with our business, that's when it becomes something very demonic. But these preachers are telling us this, but they disregard the very first commandment. To love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. They don't even talk about that one. Because if we love the Lord thy God with all our heart, our soul, and mind, it may not be their same definition of love your neighbors yourself. Exactly. 
Because I think Jesus would want the church open. Jesus would want people getting saved. Jesus would want the gospel being preached. Jesus would want civil disobedience and saying, we're going to serve you, God, rather than the authorities. That's what God would want. But we don't talk about those, and that's where you need to be careful. That's the first and greatest of all the commandments. Not the second, the first. And if I love my neighbors myself, it has nothing to do with any of this stuff. Because here's what they'll say. They'll say, well, we don't talk about homosexuality. Don't talk about these things. Don't talk about abortion because you could hurt people and you want to get them saved. Yes, I do. But the only way they're going to get saved, they hear the truth that that lifestyle is not healthy or that lifestyle is not right or killing human beings. God hates. God hates it when we shed innocent blood. Hates it. According to Proverbs, he hates it. Doesn't just like it. He hates it. And so you're confronted with the truth so you can make a better decision for your life. People are not coming to church because some lame preacher says we're not loving them like we should. They're not coming to church because the church refuses to be the church that has standards and a belief that this is where we're going. Progressive Christianity, which is not Christianity at all, affirms homosexual marriage. They'll say, it's okay, just love them. They teach that no one will ever experience hell. That's another teaching that's coming across me that no one goes to hell. Well, I got news for you, that's not what the Bible teaches. They teach pluralism. That means all roads lead to God and no one, no one religion holds ultimate truth, which is blasphemy because this is the ultimate truth. This is the truth. There are some of the false teachings infiltrating our church today and it's time to fight. It's time to contend and defend the faith. Every believer must contend for the faith. We do this by believing and acting on the truth, keeping the word sacred. We must proclaim the truth. And this can be difficult in a world that says there is no truth. And there's definitely no absolute truth. And to be honest with you, truth just doesn't exist. So we have to contend for it. Jude 17 through 23, the Bible reads, but you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life, whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, which is praying in other tongues. And await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourselves safe in God's love. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. In other words, if someone's wavering, we got to be merciful and compassionate. And not pointing our finger at them, saying, look at them, look at this. We, we should be putting our arms around them and say, come on, man, we'll walk with you. That's the way we should be. We should be. And listen, if you show mercy... To others, God will show mercy to you. If, you. if you are good to others, God will be good to you. If you're critical to others, then guess what? That's going to be critical on you as well. We have to be merciful to people. Not everybody's as perfect as you. And I say that because 99% of us are great, but there's always that one percentage of people that think they're the corrector and the criticizer, they're called to do all those things and to point out everybody's faults. I'm glad God does not point out all of our faults. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty happy about that. I mean, wouldn't it be crazy if you stood up here and an angel appeared and said, let me tell you all their faults. How many of y'all would be standing in line for that one? There's nobody in here. Nobody would be like, no, 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 because I know and I don't want nobody to know. But somehow we think in the body of Christ we're to point out everybody else's faults. That's not your job. It's not my job. Now, if people are hurting people and doing things, we've got to deal with it. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. If we are going to defend or contend for the truth, For the faith, we must, number one, we must obey God's word above all other things. Number two, we must believe it is absolute truth, that this is 
absolute truth. That's the only way we can truly believe it and act on it, that it is absolutely true. We must believe the Word has the final say on all matters. You and I can have a discussion. We can have a little debate. We can whatever. But when it comes down to it, we come back and say, what does the Word say? And whatever the words say, it has the final say. And if you don't have that mindset, then how can you walk with God? How can two walk together unless they be agreed? How can you walk and say you're born again and walk with Jesus when you disagree with most of his teachings? You can't do it. We're deceiving ourselves. Think That's why he said, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Deceiving your own selves. We deceive ourselves by saying, well, I can pick and choose, cherry pick what scriptures I want to believe in and what scriptures I don't. We can cherry pick in our own families like, well, I know, you know, my brother who was a bad alcoholic and a drug addict and a heroin addict and my other brother was a speed freak and just, they, there was just lots of issues. They, they, they had issues, they had problems, but when they got born again, they started allowing the word to, to have the final say in all matters. Like if you have a drinking problem, an alcohol, if you're an alcoholic and have a drink problem, you never drink again. If you're addicted to something, you want to get free from that. But if we're fighting over abortion and you say to me, because I had someone say this to me on a phone call oh, about four, five, six years ago, we were talking about the word and, and, and she was criticized, she was mad because I got up and said abortion's wrong and she, she began to try to correct me, and then she said this statement in this conversation. I said, sis, you're, you're out of line. Killing a baby's never right. And then she said this to me. She said, I don't care what you say. I don't care what the Bible says. This is a person that, if, you, if I say their name, some of you would know them. I believe in a woman's right to choose. Here's how I ended that conversation. I said, sis, we no longer have anything to discuss. There's no reason to discuss because you don't believe the Bible. This conversation's over. Have a good day. Because why contend when you don't have a final outcome? I mean, if this doesn't, if this is not the final say, if this doesn't have the final say on all matters, then what's the point of believing it at all? And if you're going to contend or defend the faith, we must be willing to not be liked by some. That some of our stances, some of our beliefs, we're not going to be liked. I'm sure I'm not going to get invited to the governor's lunch ever. <laughs> and I'm, I'm positive that's never going to happen. And it doesn't bother me that it doesn't happen. It doesn't bother me that she doesn't like me. It doesn't bother me that her administration doesn't like me. It doesn't bother me one bit, not even a bit. And I'll tell you why. Because I believe what we did was biblical. And whether we should obey God or the authorities, I say we should obey God. So you and I, as we walk this earth and contend for the faith, there's going to be some people not like us, including our family members. But we're never mean-spirited. That's the difference. We don't fight. We don't argue. We just say, hey, this is what the Bible says. We don't, we don't scream at them and tell them they're going to go to hell. We don't do those things because that doesn't win anybody. And here's the last thing. We must understand the truth is the truth. It never fades away. It never becomes obsolete. Heaven and earth, the Bible said, will pass away. But he said, my word will never pass away. This is for eternity. And until we believe that, we'll always be wandering in a wilderness that we have no business being in. If we don't defend or contend for the faith, many will be led astray and perish. So as I close, let me talk about the loving your neighbor as yourself. Here's what people would say. Because in our house, in this church, you can come in here any way you want. You can, you can, um, you, you know, I, however you come is how you come. But there is an expectation that once you get right with God, we begin to grow and change. And it takes a while. It, there's people on every different, you know, maturity level. Some are just starting. Some are, are going pretty strong. Some are pretty mature. But we've got them everywhere. We've got people that are sitting here now that may not even be born again or watching and when these preachers get up and try to shame us with love your neighbors yourself, they will tell people like me, because I will say this, if you're dealing with homosexuality and all that, you can come to our church because we do care, 
but you cannot have any public displays of affection in our church. Now, people said, well, I'm mean. Well, I'm not woke enough. I'm, I'm, you know, you, how can you win them if you're like that? Because we do have a standard. And they say, well, you don't love your neighbors yourself. Here's what they don't understand. The, the question is, really, I, so I don't love my neighbor as myself? Well, what about the four-year-old, the five-year-old, the six-year-old, the seven-year-old, the 10-year-old, the 12-year-old that gets to come to this church and not have to worry about being confronted with that? What about loving them and saying, you know what? They'll never look at us and say to the leadership of Legacy Church, you know what? I, I, I thought this was okay. This lifestyle was okay because I saw it exemplified and magnified in the church. What about loving my neighbors myself? Aren't those kids my neighbors also? What about protecting their rights and their freedoms and, and giving them a standard? What about loving them? That's why it's so so bad what they do and how they try to work people and how they try to shame people and say, if you love your neighbors yourself, you just put up with anything. That's not true, folks. It's the opposite of that. That is an, a, a, the antithesis of the truth. It's a lie. Loving your neighbors yourself is not just putting up with everything. It's not, having, it's not a person that has no standards or values. It's people who have standards and values and say, these are our values. Listen, there's a way you live in your home. And if I came to your home, I would, I, would, I would honor that. If you wanted me to take off my shoes, I would take off my shoes. Come on. So how, if you didn't want me to sit a cup on a table, that's fine. It's your home. And you get to protect your home and live the way you want in your home. Walk around however you want in your home. Am I right? But this is our home. And this is a community of believers, and as believers, we should honor the truth over this fallacy and false teaching and false teachers rising up trying to use the word to get us in compliance with the state. That was the ruin of Germany, and it will be the ruin when the Antichrist comes, but thank God I believe the church won't be here when all that happens. I don't want to be here. I don't. So you and I get to decide. What and who we're going to believe. But here's one thing. Don't allow yourself to be deceived. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for truth. I thank you for being here. Thank you for helping us. I thank you for strength. I thank you for wisdom. I thank you for this great body of believers, God. We're, we're moving in a spirit of agreement. We may not agree on every little thing, God. We don't have to. But we agree on the main things. That the gospel is the gospel. It should never be changed or watered down or mistreated. Father, you teach us how to win the loss. You help us become fishers of men in a greater way. You help us to, and you hear our prayers for our family members and our children to be born again and saved. And we just thank you for their salvation. We thank you, God, that as imperfect as we are, we still contend for the faith. We'll still contend for the truth of the gospel. And we won't buy into all these movements that they sound so good, God, but they're, they're not healthy. They're just not healthy. So help us to understand and recognize false teachers when we see them. And Father, for those that are teaching false, may you get their hearts and minds and may they repent and just open their hearts and minds to the Word of God. We just want to help people, God. That's what we want to do. Help us. In Jesus' name. If you're here with every head bowed and you say, Preacher, I've walked with God, but I've walked away. Today I'm going to come home. Or you're online. Or you're here and you say, Preacher, would you pray with me? I've never really given God my life. I've never submitted to His will. I've submitted to other people's will, but never to God's will. I don't even know what it is. But the beginning of knowing what it is is to ask Jesus to be Lord of your life because without Jesus, you can't get to God. There's not, all roads do not lead to God. Only one road leads to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So if that's you and you say, would you pray for me? Right where you're seated, I'm gonna pray for you. I'm not gonna ask you to do a big thing, but I'm gonna ask you to do something. And I think it's important for your walk with God, your salvation, your serving God. I think it's huge. But it's very simple to do. And if that's you with every head bowed now online, I can't see you, but God can. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. If that's you and you say, preacher, include me in your prayer right where you're seated all over this place. 
in the powerful name of Jesus. Are you ready? Without any hesitation, would you just lift your hand up and say, preacher, include me. I want, I want you. God bless 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 you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Hands going up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you over here. Thank you so much. As I look, God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. As I look across the top, thank you up there. God bless you. As I look across the top, anybody else? So many people already lifted their hand. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. As I look across the top, anybody else? Say, this is my day. We're going to get it right. God will have you. Thank you. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be safe. Thank you so much over here. Thank you so much. I see your hand, man. Thank you. I see your hand. God loves people. And you'll never experience his love until you say yes. The church can't save you, folks. Belonging to this church or any church can't save you. Only you, believing in your heart and confessing with the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ can cause you to be right with him. Anybody else before we close? Father, in the power... Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, I thank you for your grace, your mercy. I pray for each one. I pray for each person that said yes to you today, that you show yourself strong in their behalf, that you help them and you love on them right where they're at. And that, God, we, not, we, we won't be inundated and allow the world to indoctrinate our thinking. Because, Father, whatever we hear, we'll go back and say, what does the word say? And, Father, that has the final say. Give us that ability. Help us to develop that within us, that the Bible is the final say. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here and you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer aloud with me. The Bible says we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths. And I, I want everybody in here that's right with God to pray in support of those because so many lifted their hand. And listen, if you didn't lift your hand, but you should have, I'm going to introduce you to Jesus. Only he can save you. This church cannot save nobody. Your parents, your grandparents, your friends, no one can get saved for you. So would you pray this prayer with me? Would you pray, God, I choose to believe today that Jesus is your son and he's the only way there is no other way he's the way the truth and the life and so today I believe that with my heart and now I willingly confess with my mouth Jesus be Lord of my life thank you for saving me thank you for forgiving me and thank you for helping me in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord if you would.